I'm going to talk about something that two years ago I haven't heard about. <laughs> and today, these times, everybody's talking about it, but I still don't know what it is. <laughs> That's the most interesting thing about books, as I see it. Because it's a lot of hype, it's a buzzword, but it also has some kind of special meanings that might be interesting for us. In the beginning, there were two types. Well, in the beginning, it was the CMOOCs that ruled. I mean, it was a connectivist point of view. It came from Canada, a collection of resources that you could pick from and do whatever you wanted with it. You could take exams somewhere or not. But just that you're kind of learning, just in time system for learning, learning on demand. And then the Americans a little bit south of Canada, came up with the X-Books, extended books. Regulated courses, users have to sign in to access, not that free. Uh, here we have peer-to-peer, -peer, very much automated uh, ratings. And the, I think this one is good. Every letter is negotiable because you can put into it the meaning that you would write to. As you need it. What is massive? 100 people? I think 100 is massive. <laughs> if 100 people come to listen to me, I'll be satisfied. If 1,000 people come to listen to me, I'll, I'll earn some money. 100,000, just a couple of times, and I'm gone holiday. Open. Open registration, somewhere it is, yes, not always. Most of it is not open registration, open content, yes, most of it is. Is it free of charge? It should be, but it isn't. Is it affordable? Most of it is. Not all. If I want to go on Coursera, on Coursera, a paid conference thing, as a private person, I get it free. If Graciela or the Vox or this organization sends me there, they have to pay for it. And if Vox wants to put their courses on Coursera, it costs a lot, believe me. Online, real-time interaction, it should be, isn't always. Self-paced, not really anymore. The CMOOCs are self-paced, the XMOOCs are not. Do we get credits, batches, that's a new thing. They will get batches next year, not, not this year. Scripted assessments and feedback, oh yes, we get that. They are the books that came from Canada. That's what a lot of people look at books, you know, it's a threat. A threat to the university system, threat to higher education, something new that's going to disrupt what they're doing. And from time to time we need disruptions. But the X-Books today are big guys. The elite, Stanford, MIT, Harvard, now Edinburgh, Berkeley. New books all the time. It's not just an American phenomenon. In Norway we have books, Sweden books. Told him I have got lots of MOOCs everywhere. I don't know, do you know when a MOOCs from your countries? Leave me <laughs> next year. <laughs> At last. The big places to go to find these courses is Coursera, owned by Stanford, Udacity, owned by some other people from Stanford, and edX, with all the people from Harvard, MIT, and Berkeley. So I'm just thinking about why do we have X books in the States and C books in Canada? Well, in Canada, education is more or less free, more or less more like the European system, but very dispersed population, long distances. We need something to boost the competence of the people. In the States, education is very expensive, more concentrated population. So the C books, Canada. Alternative distribution, Xbooks, alternative pedagogics. And, of course, why does MIT put their courses free on the net? Because they are nice people? <laughs> yeah, perhaps. I, I guess they are nice people. I don't know them, but uh, I, I think they must be very clever anyway. And clever in the lots of senses. I mean, to attract, uh, to attract students. Yeah, and not only students from their places, but from all over the world. From distance. 
long list and yes, yes I mean, come in formal competence and real competence and things like that and there is of course a democratic element and but it's more even more important to build brand names attract people as you say to recruit students from all over the world to build critical mass and then the prices will go up believe me they will the problem with the education system higher education system in the states is that today is nearly bankrupt because of the recession. The government funding has gone down. People haven't got that much money to pay for their children, except the very rich ones, of course. So they need another base for income to boost their own existence. That's part of the book, part of the textbooks. It doesn't have to be like that here. I don't, and, uh, if you have any questions about it, I might be able to answer, but uh, it's not that really important. It's just a give me a background. So now I'm trying to say a little bit about the experiences concerning books, the way I look at it. They're not uniform. There's a lot of different experiences. Some love it, some hate it. Some like that kind of books, some like this kind of books. Some people take exams that don't know they have been from books. They just think they're doing business education, which they they kind of do, but many students do not conclude the courses or take exams. But in this setting, that might not be a problem, because if you think about <coughs> learning just in time, they have learned just what they need, and their competence is being boosted anyway. They don't need, parents don't need that exam, they just want to see what is there. So, and that's actually the strategy behind the CMOOCs, the collectivist Canadian thing. But those that do conclude get great results. But that's what was our experiences with distance learning, with teaching and all that 10 years ago. You know that if you conclude it, you'll get good results. But you need, you need motivation and self-discipline. And not everybody has that. I don't. Not all the time. Not this weekend. <laughs> not self-discipline anyway. <laughs> So, will campus life disappear? That's the future for campuses. No, it isn't. It, it, it won't be. It's more like a flipped classroom sort of things that you actually learn a lot at home and then you go to the campus to discuss with people. So, we'll still be there. The physical, social arenas will be increasingly important, we think. And then, you heard about the uh, adventure about the Emperor's New Clothes? Could this be another example of that? Could very well be, because net-based teaching, distance education, and call it whatever you want, is nothing new about it. I used to work at a place called Telenor, a big telephone company, and we did that for years. Not because we were nice people, because we wanted to sell broadband. Okay? Get it on the net and people will buy it. They wouldn't, but now they do. The business idea is different here. The old tailor teaching, distance education, you kind of just got into it, signed your name, I'm going to be on it, perhaps pay a little, but then you pay beforehand and not afterhand. No, you're paying for the exam. It should be free until the exam, but there are examples that it isn't. And we'll, uh, as I said before, Building brown arms, critical mass, that's what you have to do before you get a lot of people to pay for their exams. And there's the money. The technology is nothing new, actually, but it's more accessible. It's much easier to set up. Um, the backbone is just the same. But you have these places called Coursera, Canvas, Presenter, and things like that that make it much easier for you, but you have to pay for it before we did it ourselves. In Norway, there is a professor up at Norwegian Technology University, I'll just call it that, who have been into MOOCs for a long time. But he's not a technical person. He's a sociologist, so that's a strange thing that he is the pioneer in Norway because he sees the possibilities and he has courses up. He had one last year that 8,000 followers that concluded his course. That was free with all the prerequisites that the MOOCs should have. But now the fee is 
16,500 kroners, which is about a little bit more than 2,000 euro. That isn't free. You see the development one year to another. He never says that when he holds talks. But if you look at the, his papers, you have to pay. But all his pictures, all his talks, they are free. You can download them for free. It's very good. <coughs> but he isn't free all the time. No, no. Um, this amount is only for one course or for this is program? For, it's one program. One program, yeah. many courses. No there is one actual course, but it is a course that takes you uh, eight weeks to conclude. Yes. And that's what you pay for it when you... For eight weeks for yeah. one topic. Yeah, the topic is social media in public sector. Um, he has got a couple of thousand people getting into this because social media in public sector is a very hot thing. How to promote yourself by social media? It's not a personal thing anymore, it's a, it's a uh, much more a sector thing. So, do I think that MOOCs are a threat to the established university? Not really. Because here education is more or less free already, so we don't really have an alternative in that way. Very few people speak Norwegian. That's a shame, of course. <laughs> but we like to be kind of exotic too. So big scale business must be in English. And most Norwegian won't go for that. Although most curricula in the university are in English already, but they want the people to speak Norwegian. So I don't think it's a big threat on the, that system. But of course the government accepts the possibilities and they have now a, a MOOC commission, they call it, with, um, with that professor, it's also there of course, and a lot of other very bright people to look at the possibilities, the threats and what to do. And can we earn some money, of course. So this is what Graciela wanted me to say a little thing about. So I'll do that because I'm a very nice guy. Courses, the continuous professional development. Courses are distributed digital already. They've been for a number of years. So that's not no problem in that. It's much more into distribution than the university sector. But it's not really an open system. It's rather close. You have to, you know, a sign up before you go into, before you even can look at the courses. You have to sign up. And it's very little what I call disruptive or eclectic teaching and learning. Disruptive is the technology part. It's a very traditional use of new technology. And eclectic learning, no, it's not. You can't pick what you want to learn and put it together in the way you want to do. But the influence will come, and they may have a massive input in this area. And, and now, Graciela, this will most certainly also have an influence on the professional development and continuing education for teachers. And that's why it, what we're talking about here. And this is what Huffington Post wrote last week, actually on Friday. Coursera, a leading platform for the popular massive open online courses offered by elite universities, is moving into a new realm, the expansive field of continuing education for teachers. And this is new. They didn't start with that. They wanted to sell to students. No teachers is absolutely a target group because teachers are so rich. Not really, because these courses are still free. The announcement would give teachers pursuing their continuing education requirements a new set of options to learn from master professors at leading education schools. True, true. Um, and this is one, how MOOCs can turn teachers into rock stars. I love that one. So if you want to be a rock star, become a teacher and get a camera. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yes, click that one. Um, so How qualified the knowledge? Hmm? How qualified the knowledge of these courses? And can you use this certification? Yeah, the, the, you see, you see, that's a, that has to be a thing because the course is free, but if you need a certificate, you have to pay for it. Yeah. 
That is not great. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 but that's m that might not be a problem in a couple of years because people see you, oh, we've got paper from MIT, we'll accept that. So the, in Norway we call it Nokut, it's a, it's a body that uh, kind of gives you the go-ahead for your education. But they, I think that they will diminish if this kind of education really goes through. Be, not perhaps in public sector, in private sector it will be. Because there's a lot of firms that need, I need your competence now. I don't care if the it's public sector, no, yes, then just need it for my, for the work you're going to do. I have a new continuing education, look open for teachers. Uh, 341 free courses. The courses are free, and that's the truth. But if you need a certificate, you have to pay for it, because Coursera can't produce certificates, but MIT and Stanford and all the people have to do that. I haven't seen the price list. And then, I think this is quite good. How can MOOCs benefit teachers? Because they are learners themselves and the learner, perhaps a need to learn in new ways. MOOCs are made to aid them throughout the process of teaching. And they build the competency of teachers and support them with virtually, virtually in their professional growth, yes. They offer strategies and tips to advance students' learning and also provide training courses for teachers. And they learn to design courses themselves, that's very important, but most of them can't. Not on the net anyway, like good on the blackboard and make teachers relive the student experience. I think that's important to, to, to get that far from your past. Now we get the past back to you. Books in themselves are a resource that teachers can use in the classroom. They are already organized resources and they don't require teachers' efforts for organization. That is not true. I think the teachers should do that because then you learn more and you get, be you get to be a better teacher. That's a couple of examples here. Uh, that one's good. Teach today's online teacher, Blend the Schools Network. See, look here. Course orientation and introduction to online teaching. Building community in online courses. Editing, adapting online course content. The online teachers retreat. I think this is very appropriate. Concluding an online class, and that's a good way to stop. And then we have more like another course. About the learners, who are the learners? How are we gonna learn to teach the learners? How do they learn? So it's two, two sides, but not, not the same, actually. These two courses are give you a very good background for being an online teacher or use a MOOC or whatever you call it. So what are we doing here? Not much. <laughs> I should have done much more. Uh, I'm trying to do a bit more. We, we are experimented with streaming courses and conferences. We had one conference this Spring that was streamed out and is on our website, but it's kind of hid, hidden, because I understand that the man who hold, held the talk, he wants more money if he's, if he's screening it, and that's exactly not what we like to do with MOOCs, right? We want to be accessible to everybody. So what we're going to do next week, that the lady sitting at the end there, Liz, is going to give you a talk tomorrow. She is going to talk about uh, adult pedagogics and course outlining and outline tomorrow with real-time feedback by Twitter or dedicated mail address, mostly that tomorrow, I think, after the live streaming, which will last about five hours from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock, 15, yeah. We will edit the course task courses down to two hours of putting on our websites. 
There we hire assistants from specialists, a rather good firm, because you want, in this phase, it's very beginning, to secure quality in streaming and editing. So it's rather posh, not that posh, but it's okay. But it comes with a price, you know. But does it have to come with a price? Can it be done cheaper? Oh, yes. We call it El Cheapo Garage Productions. We've done that for years. Not MOOCs, but everything that we put on the net, we have some cheapo garage production. Announce your courses using a website and email. Granted that you have a critical mass, of course, because it won't be any use. Film and record your courses yourselves. Get a oh, YouTube. YouTube yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's uh, hip hop language. Yo, tube. Yeah. Account and upload the courses, edit it or unedit it, up to you. Embed the videos on the websites. Get feedback from users by SMS, mail or chat. And this is something that actually you can do, Garcella. It's very easy. The only problem here is to embed it, and it's not a big problem. You can put it just on YouTube if you want. Because if there's a pronounced need for your courses, and you have a dedicated and motivated client base, such cheap productions models may be all you need. You don't have to be posh all the time. This is an original example. I won't go into it here, but oh, I, can't, I can't do it, perhaps I should do. Uh, this doesn't look too bad. This is one teacher, he's a teacher school nearby here, who found he's a very good teacher in mathematics. And he found that his students had real trouble. So, to help them, he flipped the classroom and took the classroom to the homes and put out all this work on the net. Let's see if we can get it up. And this is Chip. He's filming his own comments and drawings. Do you have any sound here today? No. no. But what, uh, what, what is behind this when I put this on? Oh, it is. You don't understand what it says, but neither do I because the sound is so bad. <laughs> but the students like it, they love it. Everybody does use this. Go up in grades. See that? This is cheap. Huh? Okay. So I'll just conclude with this one. Talking about MOOCs, the technology is available. The pedagogics are more or less ready. This is to be discussed, I think. The MOOCs are here to stay, at least for some more years. Perhaps they've changed the name. So view MOOCs as, MOOCs as a possibility for Distribution of your knowledge, do not view MOOCs as a threat, because if you do that, you won't get anywhere. Thank you.